Uh, this is going to be on intradural spinal inflammatory disease. And I'll cover uh, both. So we'll initially talk about spinal cord lesions, uh, intramedullary lesions, and then intradural extramedullary or leptomeningeal lesions. Okay, so first for the uh, spinal cord lesions. Uh, I'm just going to show a few examples of spinal cord lesions just so we can go over the spinal cord anatomy. So uh, you can see here a uh, bright signal uh, in uh, the uh, central uh, portions of the uh, cord. Uh, here there's abnormal signal throughout the uh, entire spinal cord. And uh, here we can see uh, uh, areas of abnormal signal uh, bright signal on T2 on the left side of the spinal cord. And I just want to show these so we can uh, uh, just go over the spinal cord uh, uh, anatomy. So uh, uh, just to review the spinal cord anatomy, uh, gray matter in the uh, anterior horns, and uh, posterior horns, this kind of H-shaped appearance of the spinal cord gray matter. And then uh, the rest of it uh, is mostly uh, white matter, uh, large uh, dorsal column white matter tract here, and uh, lateral columns out here, uh, some uh, anterior column white matter. So uh, just to, to keep in mind, uh, uh, when we look at a spinal uh, uh, spinal cord uh, lesion, uh, try to look and see what areas are involved. So for instance here, it looks like it's just the gray matter of the anterior horns. Uh, in this one, the whole spinal cord is uh, abnormal, but the white matter is a little brighter. And you can see the, the, the gray matter uh, here is not quite as uh, bright. And uh, this one uh, uh, on the, uh, the right side of the spinal cord is normal, but on the left side, it looks like there's some bright signal here involving both the white and gray matter, not, uh, not uh, restricted to one uh, or the other. Okay, so uh, when we're uh, when we see a spinal cord lesion, we need to come up with a, come up with a differential diagnosis. So uh, this is uh, just a, uh, the types of spinal cord uh, uh, lesions that we can see. First, uh, infectious. So you can have direct infection of the spinal cord. Uh, some viruses do that. The classic one is uh, polio virus, uh, but uh, which, although we don't see polio anymore, uh, other, herp other enteroviruses uh, can cause uh, uh, infectious myelitis. Uh, West Nile virus uh, uh, causes a, an infectious myelitis. Uh, bacterial infections, uh, uh, not very uh, common, uh, but uh, Lyme disease uh, and syphilis. Uh, uh, syphilis, uh, the, the uh, uh, tertiary form, Tabes dorsalis, uh, involves the spinal cord. Uh, pyogenic cord abscess is, is pretty rare. Uh, then post-infectious or post-vaccination, uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Uh, and then uh, non-infectious uh, causes. So we can have demyelinating diseases, MS and neuromyelitis optica, autoimmune uh, disorders, uh, most commonly sarcoid, uh, occasionally uh, SLE and Sjogren syndrome. Vascular lesions such as cord infarct and dural AV fistula, uh, primary or metastatic cord tumors, and then uh, radiation myelopathy, uh, compressive myelopathy, and uh, metabolic disorders uh, such as B12 deficiency. And uh, the term idiopathic transverse myelitis is used for an inflammatory cord lesion where we uh, basically don't know what the uh, what the etiology is. So this is just a, a wastebasket uh, term for an acute inflammatory spinal cord lesion where we don't know the etiology. So uh, if we look at uh, what parts of the spinal cord are involved, that can be helpful. So uh, the spinal cord white matter uh, involved, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis is the classic uh, B12 deficiency also uh, involves the uh, spinal cord white matter, especially the dorsal columns. Some viruses will involve the white matter. Uh, gray matter, the classic is uh, spinal cord uh, infarct, uh, uh, as well as some viruses. Uh, uh, 
both gray and white matter involvement we see with uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, neuromyelitis optica, uh, some of the viruses, radiation uh, myelopathy, and uh, dura venous fistula. And if we have both brain and spine involvement, uh, we're thinking multiple sclerosis, the neuromyelitis optica, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and some viruses. All right, first uh, case, a 13-year-old girl, left-sided weakness and vision loss and history of recent UTI. So uh, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, images I showed at the beginning. Uh, we see abnormal signal on the left side of the spinal cord here, uh, involving both the gray and white matter of the spinal cord. Uh, this is a post-contrast. We do see some contrast enhancement uh, here. Uh, this is the, the area of abnormality on the uh, uh, sagittal image. It's a little bit subtle on that. Uh, we uh, scan the brain and uh, several uh, areas of abnormal signal in the white matter. Uh, here, involvement of the corpus callosum. Uh, we see post-contrast enhancement. Also see abnormal signal and enhancement in the uh, optic chiasm uh, here, mainly the right side and the uh, right uh, optic nerve. So there's an optic neuritis as well. Okay, so this uh, patient, uh, uh, given this uh, history uh, of uh, antecedent uh, uh, viral infection, uh, uh, the most likely diagnosis is uh, ADEM with both the brain and spine involvement. So uh, ADEM, uh, typically occurs a couple of weeks after a viral infection or vaccination. Uh, it looks similar to MS, uh, although you usually don't see involvement of the callosal septal interface. And the uh, gray matter involvement is much more common with uh, ADEM than with multiple sclerosis. And of course, it's a, typically a monophasic uh, disease. This is a different patient. Uh, this, uh, this is a patient with multiple sclerosis, uh, multiple lesions within the uh, spinal cord, usually fairly uh, short lesions. Uh, they don't usually extend uh, uh, over two or three segments. Uh, this one has some enhancement. The, uh, the axial images, uh, uh, the uh, MS plaques uh, mainly involve the white matter. We can see this one involves the, the lateral column here. Uh, another one here involving the uh, dorsal column. So these, uh, like in the brain, uh, mostly involve the uh, white matter of the uh, spinal cord. Another patient with uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, in this one, you can see a little bit of cord uh, expansion, uh, uh, enhancing lesion, active lesion uh, uh, can sometimes cause some cord expansion. And uh, uh, axial images, uh, uh, again, show involvement of the uh, spinal cord white matter. And on brain imaging, uh, the, the typical uh, Dawson's fingers. Uh, this uh, was a 30-year-old woman uh, uh, who presented uh, uh, with weakness, paresthesias, uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, severe symptoms at presentation. And uh, we have a, a fairly extensive uh, area of abnormal signal uh, involving most of the spinal cord extending up to the medulla. Uh, some of it enhances with contrast, some patchy enhancement uh, here. So uh, uh, this uh, patient, uh, uh, here's the uh, axial uh, images, uh, and uh, the, uh, the lesion is quite extensive. We can see it involves both the gray and the white matter of the spinal cord. Uh, the uh, image on the right is, uh, is following a steroid uh, therapy, and uh, uh, this is a patient with the neuromyelitis optica or a devic disease. So uh, this uh, is caused by an IgG autoantibody to the aquaforin-4 protein. Uh, aquaforin-4 is involved with the movement of water across cell membranes and uh, certain parts of the CNS, especially optic nerves, spinal cord, periventricular areas, uh, 
uh, brainstem and areoposterior have a lot of aquaporin 4, so these areas uh, are often involved uh, in neuromyelitis optica. Uh, there's an antibody test for it uh, uh, that's uh, very specific, although not, uh, not everyone with NMO will have a positive aquaporin 4 uh, antibodies. Uh, some of the patients with uh, NMO-like uh, symptoms uh, some of those patients with this with this kind of a presentation uh, that uh, uh, are aquaporin 4 negative will ha will will have antibodies to a MOG or myelo myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. So uh, so antibody to this uh, MOG can cause a similar uh, appearance of disease to the aquaporin 4 antibodies. And uh, there is some association of this with uh, other autoimmune diseases, uh, SLA, Sjogren's, and autoimmune encephalitis. So with uh, NMO, uh, the spinal cord lesions are usually longer than MS, uh, typically greater than three segments, sometimes uh, referred to as uh, longitudinally extensive uh, transverse myelitis. And the central gray matter is involved to a greater degree than the white matter. So uh, you can see on the axial image, uh, the involvement is more central in the cord uh, with uh, both gray and white matter involved, but a lot of gray matter involvement. The uh, cervical spine lesions uh, often involve uh, the brainstem, especially the uh, area postrema, which is uh, the dorsal part of the brain stem just below the fourth uh, ventricle where the vomiting center is. So that's uh, often involved with uh, uh, NMO. And uh, optic neuritis, when we see it, uh, it's, uh, it's usually bilateral, often extends to the optic chiasm and optic tracts. The, uh, the brain lesions, uh, uh, typically uh, are seen around the third and fourth ventricles. Uh, uh, the Dawson's fingers that we see with MS, we usually don't see with uh, neuromyelitis optica. You can have periventricular white matter involvement, but you generally don't see the, the typical Dawson's fingers. Okay, this is a patient uh, uh, who also presented uh, with uh, uh, weakness and paresthesias. Uh, uh, we can see a lot of enhancement uh, in the spinal cord. Uh, the enhancement uh, is tends to be on this one looks like it's more along the surface of the cord, but it, it does extend into the cord. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, T2 uh, bright signal within the uh, cord. Uh, axial image, we can see the uh, axial T2 uh, image showing the uh, T2 hyperintense uh, signal within the cord, and post contrast, we see the uh, enhancement more along the periphery of the cord. Uh, the uh, th the thoracic spine in this patient was also imaged. Uh, we, we can see the, the bottom of the lesion uh, from the, that was up in the cervical uh, spine. The rest of the thoracic spine was normal, although, if you look carefully in the stir images on the more lateral images, we can see that there is. Uh, uh, mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy. And this is a patient with uh, sarcoid. So uh, sarcoid uh, uh, does not have a very specific appearance in the spinal cord, although uh, one helpful feature is that the enhancement tends to be more pronounced along the cord surface and then works its way uh, uh, inward uh, uh, toward the center. So uh, like this case, the, the enhancement is, is more pronounced along the periphery. Uh, this is a patient uh, who uh, developed a fairly acute paraplegia uh, immediately following uh, spinal fusion. So the patient has a fairly extensive spinal fusion and uh, after waking up uh, was noted to have bilateral uh, paraplegia. Uh, bright signal within the central gray matter, uh, anterior horns. So this is, a, is an example of spinal cord infarction. Uh, acute onset of symptoms, uh, usually uh, 
the onset of symptoms is over a few hours, uh, sometimes not quite as acute as, as a, a stroke in the brain, uh, but uh, typically over, uh, sometimes over minutes, but sometimes over hours uh, is the symptom onset. Uh, if you do diffusion-weighted images, you can see restricted diffusion. This is a different patient with a spinal cord infarct. So just like the brain, you can see restricted diffusion in the uh, spinal cord. It's a little bit harder to get very good quality diffusion images in the spinal cord. If you uh, image in the uh, subacute phase, uh, you will see uh, enhancement, just like an enhancement of a subacute infarct. So this is uh, uh, several, uh, several days after symptom onset. And we can see, uh, although there's a, a large area of abnormal T2 signal, uh, we do see a somewhat smaller uh, area of enhancement. And when we look on the axial images, uh, the enhancement is usually limited to the gray matter. So here you can see uh, the enhancement uh, pattern in uh, more or less the uh, configuration of the uh, spinal cord to gray matter. Uh, occasionally, uh, since the spinal cord uh, is supplied by vessels that also supply the uh, vertebra, occasionally you'll have infarction of the vertebral body. So you may see, uh, occasionally you may see abnormal signal uh, within the bone marrow of the vertebral body at the same level as you see the spinal cord infarct. Fifty-eight-year-old man, progressive bilateral leg weakness. MRI, uh, we see bright signal within the uh, conus uh, here uh, on the axials. Uh, the, the signal in the conus uh, uh, involves almost the entire uh, uh, conus, except the, the periphery is not involved. So around the periphery, the signal is relatively normal, but all of the large area of the central portion uh, is uh, abnormal. Um, on the post-contrast images, uh, it's a little hard to see. There is a little bit of enhancement uh, in the conus uh, here, just some faint enhancement. And if you look carefully, you, you do see some abnormal uh, spinal cord vessels. Uh, so this, this one's a little hard to see flow voids, uh, uh, but uh, this is a patient uh, with a dural arteriovenous uh, fistula. So in these patients, uh, uh, the uh, Spinal cord edema is due to elevated venous pressure. Uh, often you see faint enhancement in the cord. And uh, these patients are frequently misdiagnosed as having some type of inflammatory myelitis uh, because of the uh, abnormal cord uh, signal and uh, uh, enhancement. And uh, we do look for vessels in the subarachnoid space, uh, dilated veins. This one we can see a lot of abnormal veins in the subarachnoid space. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, these are not always easy to see. Uh, the uh, thin section T2 space images are probably the best for showing the uh, dilated uh, veins. Uh, but if you don't see those, uh, that does not uh, rule out a dural AV fistula. Uh, I would say most of the, most of the time uh, you can see them on uh, the T2 space images. On standard T2 images, maybe only about half the time. And uh, spinal MRA is helpful to confirm uh, dural AV fistula, as well as to uh, uh, get an approximate, approximate idea of where the fistula is located. Uh, the spinal MRAs can be done either as a time-resolved, uh, uh, the uh, twist sequence, the time-resolved MRA, or it can also be done uh, as a standard uh, uh, MRA similar to, similar with a similar technique that's done for a carotid uh, contrast-enhanced MRA. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, the, the time-resolved uh, is becoming the more uh, popular uh, uh, one, and uh, usually it's easier to see, usually it's fairly easy to see the dilated uh, veins on the spinal MRA. And of course, uh, uh, for definitive uh, evaluation, the patient needs a, a regular spinal angiogram. Okay, this uh, uh, patient uh, uh, has uh, a long area of abnormal signal within the uh, spinal cord, and uh, has a lot of enhancement within it. This one really expands the spinal cord, very mass-like. And uh, 
Uh, in the cases where there's very mass-like uh, expansion with a lot of enhancement, uh, uh, this uh, we're typically dealing with a spinal cord tumor rather than an, an inflammatory disease. And this one uh, turned out to be a, an ependymoma of the uh, spinal cord. Uh, the uh, the tumors tend to, to grow more slowly uh, than the inflammatory lesions, uh, so that usually the clinical symptoms with a tumor uh, are not as uh, bad as you would expect from a, an inflammatory uh, disease that's uh, the same extent. So, so this patient, even though has a very extensive uh, spinal cord tumor, uh, clinically, did the, the symptoms were not uh, that severe, whereas the patient, uh, uh, say, with, uh, with NMO uh, that has uh, very extensive involvement has much more uh, severe clinical uh, picture. Um, so uh, that's also can be helpful in terms of distinguishing uh, tumor from inflammatory uh, lesion. But uh, generally, the tumors uh, look very uh, mass-like and, and have a an, uh, mass-like enhancement. Uh, this is a patient who, uh, with a history of uh, uh, metastatic uh, thyroid cancer and uh, uh, had a, a metastasis uh, to the uh, uh, vertebral body here. This, this was a vertebral body metastasis. Uh, it was bigger. It was, this patient was treated with radiation therapy uh, about a year ago. Uh, you can see the radiation changes in the marrow. So you can see on T1, very fatty marrow. Uh, related to radiation therapy, and you can see uh, the uh, the vertebra below. So below here, you can see pretty much where the radiation port was. Above this, uh, the, there's very fatty marrow, and below, uh, relatively uh, uh, normal marrow signal. So, uh, so we can see uh, the radiation port, and we see a lesion in the uh, spinal cord, right on stir. Uh, enhances with uh, contrast. So the question is, what is that spinal cord uh, lesion? Could that be metastasis to the cord? Uh, here it is uh, uh, on uh, uh, axial uh, image. And uh, so uh, there was a follow-up three months later. And if anything, it maybe looked a little bit worse. And then they waited another three months, and now it's starting to get better. So there's still a little bit of enhancement to here, but it's uh, resolving. So, uh, so this is a case, a case of radiation myelopathy. Typically, uh, one to two years after radiation therapy, uh, uh, varying in severity. Uh, so similar to what we get in the brain in terms of radiation injury, we can get in the spinal cord. You can have... Uh, high signal on the T2 and STIR images, you can have contrast enhancement. And uh, the key uh, here is that it's at the same level as the uh, radiation therapy. So look for that uh, uh, fatty marrow change uh, uh, related to the radiation. And if the spinal cord lesion is at the same site as the radiation, uh, most likely we're dealing with radiation myelopathy rather than a metastasis to the spinal cord. Another patient uh, with uh, a lot of uh, T2 stir bright signal within the spinal cord, uh, a little bit of contrast enhancement. Uh, uh, so here, uh, question is, are we dealing with some type of an inflammatory myelitis, or is it something else? Now, if we look, uh, we do see the patient has spinal stenosis. Uh, multi-level disc osteophyte complex is most uh, pronounced at the, this level here. And uh, if you look at the, the post-contrast images, we see the contrast enhancement is right at the area where there's maximal uh, cord compression. Uh, so this is a case of uh, compressive myelopathy. And uh, yeah, it's uh, most of the time with compressive myelopathy, you don't see contrast enhancement, but occasionally you can, and, uh, and this can... Uh, can be confusing, and that's why it's often confused with uh, inflammatory uh, myelitis. But uh, yeah, the key is the enhancement uh, occurs at the site of maximal uh, spinal stenosis. So the treatment here, uh, rather than steroids, would be a, a decompression. Okay, uh, this uh, patient uh, has some 
abnormal signal on T2. Uh, here it's fairly limited to the dorsal columns. You can see it here on the sagittal images. So selective involvement of the posterior columns. Uh, so three things that uh, can do this. Uh, uh, the classic is B12 deficiency. Uh, you can also see it in HIV uh, patients. Uh, uh, it's not clear. It may, be it may be related to B12 deficiency in those patients also. And then uh, tertiary syphilis, tabes dorsalis, also involves the posterior columns. We don't see too much of that. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, intradural extramedullary lesions or leptomeningeal lesions. And uh, uh, leptomeningeal uh, disease can have a number of different uh, appearances. So, uh, in this patient, uh, uh, we see uh, these are post contrast images. We see enhancement of almost the entire subarachnoid space. We can see the, uh, the conus uh, as being uh, darker compared to the CSF, which is brighter. And this is a T1, not a T2. Uh, here's the T2 image. You can see the spinal cord and uh, 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 spinal cord on the T2, but uh, this is a post-contrast uh, T1 showing the spinal cord uh, darker than the enhancing subarachnoid space. Uh, this one uh, is a, a more linear uh, enhancement here. Uh, the enhancement uh, is along the extends along nerve roots. You can see that nicely on the axial imaging, uh, showing the en enhancing nerve roots. Okay, so when we have leptomeningeal uh, uh, enhancement, uh, we need to come up with a differential diagnosis. So uh, infectious causes, you can have an acute uh, uh, pyogenic meningitis, although we usually don't uh, uh, image those. Uh, we usually don't do spine imaging for that. Uh, you can have a, s a subacute uh, meningitis. Uh, CMV and Lyme are the typical ones. Uh, CMV usually in uh, HIV patients or more chronic meningitis, uh, uh, such as uh, tuberculosis, uh, syphilis, or fungal disease. Uh, you can have a, a post-infectious uh, immune-mediated process. Uh, the classic is Guillain-Barre. There's also a more chronic form, uh, uh, CIDP, or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And then non-infectious uh, causes uh, uh, sarcoid and leptomeningeal tumor. And a leptomeningeal tumor, of course, can be either hematogenous metastases, drop metastases from, from brain tumor, or lymphoma. OK, so uh, this patient, uh, we see uh, enhancement of, uh, uh, of multiple uh, nerve roots. Uh, this was a, a young uh, patient, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, 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 the uh, patient turned out to have uh, Lyme disease. This was uh, Lyme uh, involving uh, multiple uh, lumbar nerve roots. Uh, and uh, we also know Lyme disease often can involve the cervical uh, nerve roots. Uh, uh, is a, it's a common cause uh, for uh, Bell's palsy. Uh, another is a young patient uh, with, uh, uh, this is on the left is a T2, uh, T1, and a post-contrast T1. And a post-contrast T1, we see enhancement of multiple nerve roots here. And uh, this one is a little bit uh, uh, interesting because if you compare the T1 post-contrast to the T2, you can see it's really just the uh, anterior nerve roots uh, that uh, are thickened uh, and uh, enhancing, and the posterior nerve roots uh, are not enhancing. And uh, when you see that combination, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, usually going to be Guillain-Barre syndrome. So uh, Guillain-Barre uh, can involve uh, both the uh, anterior and posterior nerve roots, uh, but uh, maybe 40% of the time you'll see it just involving the anterior nerve roots. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, fairly specific for Guillain-Barre. If both anterior and posterior nerve roots are involved, then it's a, a more nonspecific appearance. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, more chronic uh, form, CIDP, uh, is, uh, is much less uh, common. Uh, we don't image it very often, uh, but you can have diffuse uh, nerve root thickening with that. Uh, here we have uh, leptomeningeal enhancement, uh, and it has both a linear uh, 
as well as a more nodular uh, appearance. So with that nodular appearance, uh, uh, we uh, think uh, tumor, and uh, this was a patient with leptomeningeal metastases. Um, this is a, a CT myelogram. Uh, on the image to the left, we see some uh, nerve roots here that are clumped together uh, here as well. And then uh, uh, here we see some linear uh, septations that are passing through the thecal sac. Uh, and notice on, on this one on the right, we uh, don't see any nerve roots in the thecal sac. So this is uh, the so-called empty thecal sac sign. Uh, this was a uh, plain film uh, myelogram. Uh, you can see uh, some uh, filling defects here related to, to clumped uh, nerve roots. Uh, and then uh, uh, the rest of the thecal sac has a somewhat featureless uh, appearance. And this is the typical appearance for uh, arachnoiditis or arachnoidal adhesions. So uh, what this is, is a post-inflammatory uh, adhesions of the nerve roots. So, so uh, arachnoiditis uh, is considered, uh, uh, when people des describe it, it, we're generally talking about a, a, a chronic process, so not an acute inflammation. So this is a, is a sequela of a previous inflammatory process. And the initial uh, process can be an infection, can be an infectious meningitis, uh, or it can be due to subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, or surgery uh, that causes uh, uh, an inflammatory process within the thecal sac, uh, and the end result is arachnoiditis. And what happens is uh, normally the nerve roots have a nice, thin, smooth coating that prevents them from sticking to each other, but uh, with the, uh, the inflammation, the uh, this thin coating is, is, uh, is lost and uh, the nerve roots become uh, sticky, so they either stick to each other or they stick to the thecal sac, giving that open, uh, that empty thecal sac appearance. Uh, this is a, a MRI showing, uh, uh, in this case, uh, clumping of the nerve roots, and the big clumps of nerve roots uh, together, uh, uh, so they either can stick to each other or stick to the uh, edge of the thecal sac. Okay, so just a quick uh, review. Uh, we've uh, gone over both spinal cord lesions, uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's a big differential for uh, spinal cord lesions, and you can't always distinguish one from another. And some, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, things that are helpful. As I said, uh, we want to look and see what parts of the spinal cord are involved: gray matter, white matter. Is there brain involvement? Uh, and you really need to take into account the the clinical information. Uh, you can't interpret the images uh, without knowing what the clinical information uh, is. Uh, remember the uh, spinal cord anatomy. And for the uh, leptomeningeal uh, lesions, again, it's a pretty big uh, differential. And uh, uh, the findings uh, are also uh, often not specific, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the clinical history is often uh, the key to come up with the correct diagnosis. Thanks for your attention.